Hey, Poker People, it's Sky Matsuhashi, and this is the Smart Poker Study Podcast. Yesterday was episode 129, which was four of seven in a row. And in that episode, I discussed why it's okay to use Evernote and other apps at the live poker tables, and I discussed some things to look into to fix that sagging red line. Hey, poker people, thanks for listening and connecting with me and for sharing the show with all of your friends. I totally appreciate it. You guys rock super hard. Thank you. And uh, of course, oh yeah, thank you very much for joining me for day five of seven in a row, all leading up to my 28 days of poker study challenge. To join in and study with me starting April 2nd, visit www.smartpokerstudy.com slash 28 days to get all the details. Alrighty, we've got three great questions this episode. Please visit the show notes page for everything I discussed today, along with screenshots and links at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod129. And while you're there, sign up for the weekly boost for exclusive poker strategy to your inbox. Alrighty, let's get to it. Gambate! And now for our feature presentation. Okay, so this question comes to us from Rui. I won't read the full email. But Rui loves the game of poker and is playing a ton more now. Although he still considers himself an online cash game newbie, he does make money at the 1020 Live Limit Cash Games, though, at his local casino. So here are his questions from the email. I was thinking maybe I should focus on micro 6 max cash games since I only have a couple hours a day to play. What do you suggest? Actually, my main question is that I'm thinking to play poker on a full-time basis. I'm expecting my first child. What is your suggestion for me to start? Alrighty, well, congrats on the baby, Rui, and uh, thank you very much for the questions. So, let's hit the online stuff first. I say play both 6 max and full ring micro stakes cash. You must be able to adapt and play both because, you know, at any time, the fish could be on the full ring tables or the 6 max tables. And your goal is to find the fish at your stakes and win money from them. This could mean full ring some nights and six max some other nights, or even a combination in any given session, two of each, you know. Also, to go along with this, for developing your online skills to take you from a newbie to a pro, uh, I want you to go with micro stakes that... Uh, that your bankroll can afford 40 buy-ins or more, but don't exceed the 25 NL level. Right now, you're learning the game, and you don't want to get in over your head, but I do recommend starting it at actually 10 NL. Once you can beat the games for five big blinds per 100 hands at 10 NL, and if you could do this over a few months' time, you know, then you can move up to 25 NL, beat those stakes at five big blinds per 100 hands for a few months, then move up to 50 NL. And the other part, Rui, uh, the other part of your question about going pro, there are three things that you have to consider. First, are you built for 30 to 40 hours per week playing poker? You need to test this out. So I recommend to take a two-week vacation from work and try to play 40 hours each week. This is something that most people would try to build up to, but I want you to just test it out to see how you like it for this two weeks, you know. If you can't stand playing that long, if you hit that 20-hour mark and want to leave the tables, then maybe full-time poker isn't right for you. The second thing you have to consider is you need to have the support of your family and those around you. If your spouse, and in this case for you, especially your spouse, because you got a baby on the way, but, uh, you know, your spouse, your parents, and your friends, they all need to believe in you and believe that you can be, um, a, a full-time pro poker player. If not, you have to try to convince them that you're good and profitable and that you can make a living from poker in order to get them on your side. It is so tough being a pro if you don't have the support of those around you. And the third consideration, you need to have at least 6 to 12 months of expenses, and those expenses need to be covered 100%. You need to add up everything that you spend in a month on rent, food, entertainment, uh, gas, insurance, baby formula, baby clothes, doctor visits, all that stuff. You need to add it all up and multiply it by 6 or 12, and uh, you've got to have at least that much saved up. And this will give you some wiggle room in case things don't go well. And we all know there's downswings, whether you are a pro, a live player, online, a reg, um, not, not a reg, I'm sorry, a, you know, a, a weekend warrior or a pro, that kind of thing. No matter what, there are downswings. So having this backup savings is really going to get you through those downswings. But uh, good luck to you, Ruby, whatever you decide to do. And good luck with the baby. Congratulations. 
So question two today uh, comes to us from Greg, and he was the same Greg from yesterday's episode. So uh, he says, I understand calculating the odds of a bet to determine if I'm getting the right odds to call, but I'm having a little hard time thinking about how equity tells me whether to call or not. If I'm getting the right odds to call, uh, if I'm getting the right odds to call a bet, then why do I care what equity I have in the pot? Alrighty, well, thank you very much for that question, Greg. And uh, let's do some math right here. Regarding equity and pot odds, uh, comparing the two is how you decide whether or not it's a profitable call. You can't just look at it and say, oh, he bet half pot. It's worth calling. I'm on a draw. I'll do it. That's not good enough. I mean, just the size of the bet doesn't doesn't matter in itself. You need to compare that with the equity that you have in the hand. So we can look at this with two different situations. Let's say number one. You have an open and a straight draw plus a flush draw for 15 total outs. Now, 15 outs is 30% equity in the pot, you know, using the times two rule for drawing hands, which I talked about back in episode 111. Um, if your opponent bets half pot, you need at least 25% equity to make a profitable call. And remember, the break-even math on that is your call divided by the total pot after your call. So, uh... Half pot bets, you need a call and have 25% equity. Well, you have at least that here with your 15 outs and 30% equity. But if you only had a flush draw for 9 outs, then you only have 18% equity. So you shouldn't make the call. So having less outs makes your call unprofitable here with this bet sizing you're facing. And a second situation. Let's say you've got top pair on the river and your opponent bets $30 into $50. Your $30 call is trying to win a total pot of $110. So you need about 28% equity, you know, 30 divided by 110. Maybe you think that you only beat 25% of his range. Well, then you can kind of equate that to equity. That means you have 25% equity in this hand. You need 28 to call, so it's not a profitable call. But let's say that you beat him half the time. If it's a 50-50 instance and you only need 28% equity, great, then make the call. That's how you should use pot odds coupled with your outs and equity in the hand, Greg. I hope this helps and good luck. Today's sponsor is Habwin.com. You can win extra rake back with Habwin.com. You know, the rake you pay in the poker rooms, it's yours. And Habwin pays it back, exactly like the poker rooms do for professional players. I know you'd love to get the same cashback deals the professional players get. So visit www.habwin.com slash get poker cash back like a pro. That's all one word. I'll say it again. Habwin.com slash get poker cash back like a pro. Go there to learn how you can get exclusive pro-like cash back for your own play. All right, so my first book, How to Study Poker, Volume 1, is available as an ebook on Amazon.com. I'm super stoked about it. It's only $4.99 right now. It's a really good deal. And I loaded this puppy up with all the study techniques I employ on a daily basis to increase my skills. If you buy it, please leave an honest review. And if you send me a screenshot of your review, I'll send you the audiobook version as my thank you for helping to spread the word. Also, in just three days, my 28 days of poker study will kick off on April 2nd. And I want you to join me. Just go to www.smartpokerstudy.com slash 28 days to get more details and to join me on this 28-day journey. During the 28 days, I'm going to stream my daily studies, daily study sessions, as well as my America's Card Room cash game sessions later that night. And I'm going to show you how I set goals, plan my week of study, how I actually perform my studies, then how I put those studies into action on the felt. And I'll be using a ton of study techniques from the big book. So please join me, smartpokerstudy.com slash 28 days. Alrighty, back to class, poker people. The final question today is about facing good players, and it comes from Domenico. He asked a question earlier during the day um, at the webinar. This was this past Saturday. He asked a question during the webinar, and after noodling on my answer for a bit, he emailed me this follow-up question. And he goes, Today I asked you about poker stars and what rooms are better for fishing. But during the day, this question has been uh, going around in my mind a lot, and I've been thinking about one aspect. Of course, playing poker in rooms where the field is softer makes us more easily gain money. But what about the skills that we might develop if we play in rooms where the competition is harder, like poker stars, for example? All right, thanks for that follow-up question, Domenico. Um, I really do like where your mind's at, for sure. 
There are plenty of skills that we develop playing versus the fish, and plenty of other skills that we can develop playing against the regs. You definitely need to play against good players to improve your skills and learn ways to beat them. It also prepares you for moving up in levels. And there's another benefit to playing against good players. You can learn from their plays if you take the time to analyze them. But here's the kicker. You'll find good players in every room. If you can find tables with 80% fish and 20% regs, that's great. You'll take from the fish and learn from the regs. Playing at sites where there's a 50-50 ratio of fish to regs is still good, but it's not as good as that 80-20 ratio for sure. Uh, But regardless of where you play, you're going to be learning as long as you're paying attention. So you don't really need more regs to learn. You need more fish to earn more. Ooh, I like that. You don't need more regs to learn more. You need more fish to earn more. That should be on a t-shirt. Somebody print it up for me. That and uh, the other day I said, consider before you click. That's a good one. Uh, And in the the past, I've said, uh, if you're flummoxed, don't flounder, just fold. Alliteration is always good. Um, But my favorite of all time, my favorite saying of all time might be uh, uh, cash, grass, or ass. Nobody rides for free. I love that. Never seen on a t-shirt, seen on bumper stickers, but yeah, that's a real good one. But uh, anyway, Domenico, find tables where there's 80, 20 fish to rags. And if you have to, 50-50, but the more fish you have, the merrier. Good luck fishing, Domenico. Challenge! Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Learn from the regs. In your next study session, find the reg that you think is a profitable player and bring up their stats in Poker Tracker 4. Go ahead and dissect their stats and see where you think they make good decisions. Filter through their hands and see how they play in position versus out of position, how they play 2-bet versus 3-bet pots, and how they play their draws on the flop. And of course, you can also look at how they approach the turn and the river. You can also just look for weaknesses that you can exploit. But hunting for strengths to put into your game is another avenue you can take. Now it's your turn to take action and do something positive for your poker game. Now get it on. Thank you so much for listening today. I really appreciate you lending me your ears for these few moments. This episode is not complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod129. Go there to uh, see screenshots, find links and everything, and to discover ways in which you can support the podcast and keep me keeping on. Make sure you join me on my 28 days of poker study by going to smartpokerstudy.com slash 28 days. And of course, if you buy my new book, How to Study Poker, Volume 1 on ebook, send me a review, an honest review, please. I really want those honest ones. Send me a screenshot, and I'll reply with my audiobook version of the book. Alrighty, if you can type out the words Smart Poker Study, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube. Or, of course, send me an email to sky at smartpokerstudy.com. And thank you to Habwin. Please visit habwin.com slash get poker cash back like a pro. Go there to sign up for great cash back deals. Alrighty, poker people. Tomorrow I'll be answering two more of your questions, so keep them coming. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.